everyone, it's Lisa with Flying. I am super excited to kick off our first ever virtual event with someone I think of as the king of Stoke, Kevin Quinn. Kevin is the founder of the High Sierra Fly-In, an event we just came from this past weekend. And Kevin, we've got a lot to dive into, but before we get into that, I'd love to have you share your background in aviation and how you got started. Oh, hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. It's so uh, a little different than the dirty, dusty playa we were just on this last week. And Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, man, the High Sierra's turned into something that's just, I feel like I have this tiger by the tail and to have folks like yourself and people coming from all over the planet, just it's a welcome sight to uh, be turning people on to such magical days in the desert, dead cows special. But you asked about my background, my flying. I was raised in Alaska at a young age, flying around in the backseat of my dad's airplane. Uh, got my private pilot certificate at about 17, 18 years old. I'm 52 years old now been flying since I was a little kid and I'm so passionate about what it is that we're doing and the opportunity to, you know, be able to have the access that we have with our backcountry airplanes is just, there's nothing like it. And it's so special to me. And I just want to be able to have that opportunity to turn everybody on to those opportunities we have because we're so lucky. It's awesome. Yeah. Super special indeed. So tell us, when did you start the High Sierra Fly-In and how did you get it started? What was the idea behind it? You know, High Sierra started uh, here when we're in northern Nevada area. The the backcountry access is literally, it's Mecca. There's nothing like it. And around my birthday every year, when we started 12 years ago, I thought, man, we should just take a handful of buddies, go camp in the desert and do our thing and what we do. And so there were six or eight of us that went out to the desert. We had so much fun. The next year we came and said, we should tell some people and bring some more people. Well, that eight turned into about 20. The following year, that 20 turned into about 60. The year after that, that 60 turned into about a two or 300, and it's just continuing to evolve. Where this last season, we had uh, just recently, we had just around 1,000 airplanes in the lake bed and right around 3,000 people. And uh, I hope that we can have 5,000 airplanes and 50,000 people that are all like-minded. There's just, there's nothing like it. Of course, we have the lake bed, the dead cow lake bed, and the opportunity is so big, so vast that, oh man, it's just, it's, I feel so lucky to be able to have these folks wanting to come see us in the desert. And then, of course, all the like-minded individuals promoting aviation. It's just, there's nothing like it. It's awesome. But that's really how High Sierra was created. Around my birthday with a handful of us uh, and word of mouth got out that, you know, there's a bunch of backcountry bumpkins having a good time. And, of course, you know, that brings everything else as far as now we're, when we started, it was just us out there doing our thing, but now we've got our crash fire rescue and our paramedics and our EMS and our flight control tower and FAA accreditation and waivers and you name it, the list goes on and on and on for responsibility, but it's just such a neat thing. And many are, are coining it the burning man for pilots. You know, it's, it's burning man for aviation without the drugs. And we're so excited to be doing it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say the Burning Man of Aviation, uh, minus the psychedelic drugs, a whole lot of great, good, clean fun. <laughs> good for all ages, for sure. <laughs> so obviously, High Sierra has grown a lot since year one. Um, has it always included traditional stall or stall drag? And can you help us understand the difference between those two things? Yeah, you know, uh, we've been part of doing traditional stall since basically the birth of bush wheels. We get our bush wheels on our planes, which are the cartoon sized tires that kids call them and allows us access into this off airport arena, so to speak. Well, traditional stole is something we do every single day, every single landing. Of course, we've taken it. We're part of the Oshkosh stole demo team and we do some of the various stole, traditional stole contests. Well, seven, eight years ago, I was literally, uh, people laugh, but I, you know, we're sitting in the morning on the think tank because where all the great ideas come from. And I'm like, how can we create something that's different than traditional stole and something a little, you know, more fun, so to speak. And we thought, and I'm sitting there literally doing my business. And I, I think, you know, man, everybody loves racing and NASCAR and smoke and fire and loud music. And wow, I wonder if we try put an airplane side by side because in the desert there at Dead Cow, the lake bed's four and a half miles long. Why don't we try lining up side by side and seeing how that works, see what the distance is and what it takes to bring the equalizer in no matter what you're flying. And uh, one thing leads to another. We started with a mile, then we went to a half mile. We played with various lengths. 
we've come down to a, a 2000 foot track and really that's the equalizer. A guy can be flying a Cessna Skywagon, 185, 180, 170, 172s, competing against the Highlanders, the Kit Foxes, the Carbon Cubs, you name it. And that 2000 feet is really an equalizer. Now it comes down to pilot skill and engine setup. And so we created three classes, our bronze, our silver, and our gold classes. Our gold racers, there's only a couple, but there's a whole bunch of folks out there building special aircraft for stall drag with 400 horsepower engines, nitrous. That's our pro class. And these guys are doing down and back to a complete stop on both ends, 2,000 feet in under a minute. Our silver guys do it literally, and those are your carbon cubs, your sky wagons, high pilot skill, higher powered engines, but still not the gold class. And those guys do down and back in about a minute five to minute 10. And then we have our bronze class, which brings in everybody else. We had two new rookies at High Sierra. One was flying a 182, Aaron Greer, and then John, uh, drawn a blank on his last name, flew a Zenith 701. And they were our bronze class world champions this year at Stoll Dragon. So it really brings in everybody. And Stoll Drag is, is everybody's event. It's a landing and takeoff event that's like no other. Literally, it's straight level, down and back to complete stops, landing on heading, turning around, coming back that 2,000 feet. There's a lot that goes into it with the power and energy management skills that we could talk more about. But really, you know, I, I get so long-winded, Lisa, I, your question was how did it how did it create, you know, stole drag and how long have we been doing traditional stole? Well, traditional stole was sort of the, the baby for all this and it just grew into this crazy event now that we call stole drag and it's caught wildfire and Pilots love it. There's a whole lot of skill and, and parameters that go into it. It's ultimately the FA coined it. What you guys are really doing is making good pilots better. And, and that's the mission behind Stoll Drag. The idea that folk can come and, and learn about all the various skill sets, the power and energy management, the directional and altitude, altitude control, the spot landing, not to mention the psychological aspect. When they go through this training, whether or not they get to actually go end up racing for rubber trophies and a few peanuts, Ultimately, they leave and they become a better pilot. And like I said, the FA looked at us when they, we were getting our accreditation. They said, what you guys are really doing is actually making good pilots better. And we were able to get an accreditation for our training and for our course, which now we can take Stoll Drag on the road. And there's a lot coming up this spring, which is exciting. That's all extremely exciting. Bringing Stall Drag on the road, I think, is such a big aspect to growing the sport to growing aviation, obviously there's a great appeal here. You know, we've talked about this in the past. Every sport, if you think about it, has its own competition, right? For aviation, stall is obviously becoming that entry point extreme competition. Can you talk about why it's so popular? Is it easy for someone who's getting into aviation and earning their pilot's license who wants to sharpen their skills? Is it easy for them to compete in something like this? 100%, you know, stole, short takeoff and landings, really is uh, is what I encourage everybody as a, as a mentor, as a longtime CFI, teaching people how to fly. It's one thing to be proficient, and it's one thing to go out and get your certificate. But really, when you earn your certificate, it's a license to learn, right? And so now the FAA has coined this, you know, you got to stay current. Well, what's current? Three takeoffs and a landing to a complete stop in 90 days. Well, that's great, but are you really proficient? And so with Stoll Drag, bringing in all of these skills for your everyday flying, and I'm a broken record, the power and energy management, the directional and altitude control, the spot landing, the psychological aspect, because everybody now, your buddy lands somewhere and they get the camera out. Come on, Bob, you can do it. And that psychological element plays a big part in it. And so really when you go through this Stoll Drag training and you're out training to make yourself better and taking yourself beyond currency, making yourself proficient and really going beyond proficiency. It's it's so important for us that pilots, especially in the days of COVID now where folks aren't getting to fly, they're not getting to play enough, but then all of a sudden they load their airplane up and they fly into the backcountry with their family. Well, they might be current, but are they proficient for where they're going? And, and that's what we're doing with Stoll Drag. We're taking people beyond proficiency so that these skills that they're learning in Stoll Drag really come back and correlate to their everyday flying that they do in their own environment so that they are proficient and then some. And Stoll Drag is for everyone. It's, it's something that allows access to what we're doing on all levels, be it the low end 172s to the high end 400 horsepower aircraft. There's something for everybody. It's, it's exciting. We're super stoked to be part of it and just represent what we're doing and try to continue to make pilots safer.
That's just awesome. We're um, so you know one of the things that was noticeable about this year's event. I, first, I don't know how you pull off what you do. It's quite an accomplishment. You literally create an airport in the middle of Dead Cow Lake Bed in the High Sierras. Um, you have personnel that support that. Obviously, an incredible team um, supporting the event. Um, and it appears that safety was very much at the forefront this year. Um, you brought in a team from Reno for fire and rescue. Um, tell us a little bit, with the format of the race, you've talked about training. Um, is there a training requirement in order to compete in this event at the event like Reno would require, for example? hundred percent. You know, safety is paramount to everything. And so we became this new class. We're the first new class in 2019 at the Reno Air Races since the jet class 21 years ago. Well, we didn't take that uh, with any fine grain of salt. What a huge coup, feather in our cap. We're so grateful. Well, COVID being grounded allowed us to literally create a stack of paperwork 10 miles high, but we went out and sought out national accreditation. And our training course became, got that accreditation and we did as a class. So now we can take that on the road. But as you say, you know, safety is always, it's not a matter of if, but when, and we live in the model that when's not an option, but when, when happens, we have to make sure all of our I's and T's are dotted and crossed. And so as we grow and we get bigger, uh, the crash fire rescue, the paramedics, care flight, the, everybody that's on call from fire suppression to extrication to, like I say, the care flight folks, the EMTs, paramedics, they all need to be on standby because it's not a matter of if, but when something happens, we're going to need all of those folks available. And I'm a big believer in uh, dot your I's, cross your T's. In my entire life, having a heli ski operation of 25 years, an EMT educator, an avalanche educator, a uh, heli ski guide trainer. I was president of the U.S. Heli Ski Association for 11 years. My entire business is keeping people safe and training people in that mindset of just, it's not a matter of if, but when. And when when happens, you better make sure that all your I's and T's are dotted and crossed. And bringing that to High Sierra as we continue to grow, you know, ignorance is bliss when you're young, but now there's no, uh, there's no exceptions for ignorance now. You have to make sure that you're doing your diligence so that People are safe and, and keeping them safe. And that starts from our tower crew all the way down to our crash fire rescue to all of our volunteers and just keeping people safe. And at High Sierra in particular, like you notice, boy, we've got so many kids, dogs, children, families. That's what it's all about. You know, we're inspiring aviators all over the planet, young and old. But ultimately, we are uh, an incident away from a bad day. And we do everything that we can to mitigate those measures. And when it does happen, our I's and T's better be dotted and crossed so that people walk away and know that we did everything we could in our power to make sure people were safe. If we have an incident at any time at Dead Cow, we're 30 seconds away from help and rescue and uh, at any, either end of the course. And that's either just regular random pilots showing up and or our participants in the landing and takeoff event itself, Stoll Drag. Keeping people safe is what we do. That's our business. And uh, it's it's a pleasure to do such. But really, at the end of the day, when people leave and think, man, that was a lot of fun, they ultimately summarize it by the experience and the level of safety that they had and felt for their family. And if you keep people safe and make them feel safe, their experience is going to escalate and that be even better. And so I'm a big believer in all that big time. That's great, Kevin. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously there is um, a lot of space to work with up at Dead Cow Lake Bed, and you referenced like, hey, let's grow it to maybe 50,000. <laughs> Would love to see that happen. Uh, what really, in terms of growth, how many events do you think it's possible to produce uh, for uh, the stall drag competition around the United States? What does the future of stall look like in that regard? Future Stoll Drag, literally, like we started, I feel, Lisa, that I have this tiger by the tail and I'm hanging on for the ride. Um, we're going to announce here soon that we will be, AOPA has their East and West Coast fly-ins. We have some logistics to, to iron out, but it looks as though Stoll Drag is going to be the marquee headline for all the AOPA events, East Coast, West Coast. Uh, just yesterday, we were awarded Copper State Buckeye, which is in February. Buckeye, uh, Copper State have joined forces annually. They've been getting 20,000, 30,000 people at their show. We want to bring 50,000 people to Buckeye, Arizona in February to watch Stoll Drag and some of the best of the best. We'll put on our course there for two days so pilots from around the country can come and learn about Stoll Drag, enhance their own personal skills, and then have the opportunity to race for some rubber trophies and possibly some, some Monopoly money, so to speak and uh, start our tour this next year, 2022, looks to have eight to 10 stops. 
we don't want to grow so big that we lose the control. Uh, but we want to have this continue uptick that, you know, the pilots are excited about it, the media, the fans are excited about it. But ultimately, we also have our own personal life and whatnot. And we think that an eight to 10 stop tour, and I can already think of the fact that we're going to start at Buckeye. We will then go to Wayne, Nebraska in May for the May Day Stoll event. So that's two right off the bat. You throw in the two AOPAs. Now we're four. You put in Reno and High Sierra. That's six. We're potentially going to Ontario or Wiser, which is in the Pacific Northwest. Throw in a potential Arlington. Now you got eight. Holy cow, how many more do we need? I'd like to have one more on the West Coast or East Coast potentially. But I think an eight to ten stop tour this next year is going to be a lot. And uh, I just, you know, again, staying to the course, keeping it as good as we can, professional, positive, and, and this uptick that, you know, 2023, we may have 10, 20 stops, who knows, And as our pilot pool grows. And so this next year will be the first time where we have, you know, awards for sort of like a point system where they go and they interact in every every event. So they're building their own points so that we can have an overall world champion when we show up at High Sierra next October. And so the future's bright. I just keep saying, if we think it, we can do it. There's uh, a couple of locations right now. Uh, Grand Prairie, Alberta is wanting, or Grand Prairie up in Canada is wanting to come. Uh, I believe that's Alberta, not Saskatchewan, Alberta. And they are wanting us to come there to do an event. Uh, there's potential in Mexico. There's potential in Dubai. One of the big famous princes flew the entire Formula F1 class over to Dubai to race. And they've reached out about having Stoll Drag come there. And so the future's bright. I want to go to Dubai. If you're listening, Mr. Prince, bring us there because we want to blow people's <laughs> minds. <laughs> I want to go there too. But, you know, hey, we'll start you're with coming. all these great stops in the United States. I'll be there. Maybe with my own plane. That'd be lovely. Uh, <laughs> but well, yes, that's a lot the, growth, the, growth is, the growth is endless. It's okay. an opportunity that we don't take lightly and that we just want to do it right. Yeah, it's very exciting. Well, obviously, there's a lot of appeal about participating in stall because it is an affordable uh, form of racing for many pilots. Um, it's very exciting. The future is bright. You've heard quite a bit here, Kevin. Thank you for sharing all of this. Um, we will at Flying do our best to communicate with our audience on where all these events are throughout the United States and beyond our borders. It's very exciting. We're going international, it sounds like. We can't wait to see what the future of this sport will hold. And Kevin, we, this sport would not be what it is without you. We're grateful for what you're doing to help grow aviation. It's really important for the pilot community to give them something to achieve, to give them something to build skills towards. Um, we're super excited to have you participate in this first ever kickoff of our virtual event. Um, thank you so much. Have an awesome time in Hawaii. I know you and Jess are on your way there. It was great meeting you guys out at High Sierra, and I hope this is the beginning of a very long relationship between flying and everything you guys are doing. Well, we're, we are so excited, and I thank you so much. We do. We have a swell coming. I'm off to chase waves tomorrow morning uh, at our little place over in Kauai, North Shore, Hawaii. Um, but really, it's so exciting, too, to have flying support us in this new direction that flying's going, and can't wait to see the new uh, both online and print, you know, chasing that surfer's journal. I'm a I'm a surfer's journal fan. I read it religiously. And so the layout, the content, the new owner, we're so it's it's awesome. And we welcome it with open arms. And thank you so much for having us, really. Yeah, no. Hey, we're thrilled. Can't wait to see the first issue of the magazine. It will have a major feature on High Sierra Fly In. Um, shot by uh, Leonardo Luna, a great photographer who's been shooting your event for many years. Thanks to you for connecting us. Um, it's going to be pretty spectacular. Have a great time in Hawaii. What's going on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's Lisa. determined. We don't want to disappoint you, yeah. Kevin, I promise. <laughs> well, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. It was, all images yeah. are awesome. And I just truly thank you. I appreciate you guys really. Thank you.